Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner, and my guest today is Brian Bradley. Brian, thanks for joining me. Brian, welcome. Uh, thanks, Dr. Andrew, for having me on and putting this all together. And this is going to be a big topic, especially for your physician listeners who are also investing in, in other assets like real estate. And I just hope that the concepts we talk about are going to help your listeners understand this area of asset protection and why you even need to consider it. Right. So uh, we're going to be basic here. You know, when I think we're going to talk about asset protection today, and that assumes you have some some assets. You know, and when I think about asset protection, you know, for me, it's kind of like for guys, you know, like Jeff Bezos and, you know, people that have lots and lots of money and have to worry about it. Um, you know, I never really considered myself to be in that sort of category. So first of all, who needs to be thinking about asset protection? Yeah, that's a great question. I think anybody who wants to invest in something beyond just their personal residence is going to, because the more you have, the more you accumulate, the bigger visibility. Like think of it as a big red button. The more you have, or even if you're presumed to have, because you can just be coming out of, for example, medical school, have a white coat, have no money and a lot of debt, but because you have a white coat, you're presumed to be one of the haves. And so you're going to be a mark. And as you start accumulating more money, you're going to start investing. And as you start investing, your mark is going to grow and grow and grow. So as soon as you decide to buy that first asset, that's when you need to start considering what do I do to limit the liability side of it? You know, have it for use and enjoyment. How do I separate out the liability side of it? And that starts right from the get-go. So give me an example. What kind of asset that I would buy for myself put opens me up to risk. I mean, like a, like a boat is a, a boat, boat. Absolutely. Is a risky asset. Think of anything that needs a key that, that needs a key that has a motor that you need to have insurance on, um, that can go boom. That's a risky asset. Um, real estate, very risky assets because then you're having, you know, your landlord, you have tenants in there. A lot of things can go wrong. For example, I have a doctor as a client who is a California resident, and this is going on right now, purchased a investment property out in Jersey. Um, rented it out, didn't know it was rented out to a gang member. They had a party, uh, guns were drawn, ended up having a shooting in the apartment, a person was killed. And now the doctor in California is being sued for wrongful death. And so these are the things that you need to consider. And just, it's not, it's not the things that you know that are going to wipe you out. It's generally the things that you don't know that you don't know, and you don't really plan for. And even if you would have insurance in that situation, that's really not going to cover you for the, for that type of a lawsuit. And so you need to go to a second layer of protection, which would be an asset protection plan. And at, so now you're an attorney and you specialize in this area. Um, so I would come to you and I say, well, I have a boat, you know, I have my, my house, my cars, and I'm thinking of buying a, you know, an apartment that I could rent out or an Airbnb. That's pretty popular these days, but there's a lot of people traipsing in and out. So I'm going to have insurance, of course, right? There's, uh, you know, in case, the place burns down. And I guess uh, I know about umbrella insurance if somebody breaks their leg going down the stairs. But I don't know, having shootouts in my condo, I hadn't really thought about that. And uh, so what would you do? What would you tell me if I'm sitting across from you in your office and we got to come up with this asset protection plan. Yeah, so I'd say the first thing is what like what even is this really weird fancy term that you're starting to hear? You know like what is asset protection? And so the first thing to understand, it's not traditional estate planning. It's just modern estate planning um, and we're combining a bunch of different areas of law and essentially all we're doing is just placing a legal barrier between your assets and a potential creditor meaning a person suing you before it's needed. And I'm going to repeat that because it's really key before it's needed. And that's it. You know, it's just a barrier, like a safe for your gold or your guns or anything of values or valuables. Um, you want to place those values be into these legal protection areas out of your personal name so that it's not easily attached with a lien or reach, you know, with a lawsuit, you know, just like the rich. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Tony Robbins. And I really like the Tony Robbins saying, you know, success leaves clues. The rich don't own things in their personal name. Their business entities do, like their LLCs, their estate plans do, their asset protection plans do. 
they just get the beneficial use and enjoyment out of them while separating out the liability side. And so as you grow and scale in your life, you want them to mimic what the rich do. Risky assets would go into an LLC, and then you layer your protection planning as you go. Like you mentioned, insurance. Insurance is a very base level of asset protection. The issue with insurance is it's good for small things like grandma slips and falls and breaks her wrist. It's not there to cover you for large claims like a big massive mold issue in your duplex that you rented out. And it's not there for anything that's like intentional wrongs. So when you think about being sued, you need to know what your claim limit is. Insurance provides capital to fight a claim that gets wiped out during litigation. And then you're going to be on the hook to pay the rest of it. Now, insurance doesn't pay for intentional wrongdoings and intentional acts. And once you're sued, the insurance defense's job, because there's this industry called insurance defense, their job is to create legal wiggle room for you to not have to pay a max claim. And that's going to be going through intentional acts and wrongdoings. And that's as simple as a judge saying, hey, you sent an email saying the plumbing was done. That's an intentional act. And so just by nature of sending that email, the insurance company is going to say, well, hey, now there's a possibility that this whole entire claim has an intentional wrongdoing aspect to it. We're not covering you. Good mm -hmm. luck. If you think we're wrong, sue us. So now you have to sue your insurance provider as well as being sued. And now you have a multi faceted lawsuit that you have to fight on two ends. Now, as a physician, I have malpractice insurance. Yes. And that's for my work. Now, do, do I need anything on top of that? So that's a, that, it's a really convoluted one, that question, because it comes down to personal risk tolerance at that. Um, because you also have these situations where you have above policy malpractice lawsuits. And so some people just don't perceive enough risk. So a simpler form of protection uh, is enough for them, you know, like their malpractice insurance. And most will carry around a million dollars. That's kind of general. Um, OBGYNs, though, really high risk of liability and above um, policy limit lawsuits, as well as cardiovascular surgeons. Those are a lot of my type of clients right there. Um, for them, malpractice is a greater risk. Others, it may, be, it may not. Um, for others, then you have to look at what's the other area of your life that you have and what, what other risky investments do you have? And also realize you're a business owner, most likely, if you have a private practice. That's not covered through malpractice. And so then you're going to have to have business insurance. And then you also have to worry about employment lawsuits, as well as lawsuits, you know, like through the property that you own and the business that you have in itself. So it may not be that malpractice is important or a high risk issue for you, but then you have to look at your business side of your practice as well as your life. And then the assets that you own on top of that, like real estate um, and other things that you may own like boats or yachts or whatever it is. Now, I remember about 20 years ago in my community, there was a physician who was accused of, uh, basically it was a sex for drugs issue. And uh, he discovered that this his malpractice did not cover that because there was a civil suit. And so how do you protect yourself against things like that? That's where having an asset protection plan comes into the, okay, then what? Or if the malpractice coverage isn't gonna cover it all or it gets all that money and capital because really malpractice is the same, insurance is the same as normal insurance. It provides capital to fight a lawsuit. Generally, that's going to get eaten up in litigation because litigation is very, very expensive. And so what an asset protection does it is it brings you to negotiating table of a lawsuit in a position of strength. Um, the assets are out of your name. Generally, you would layer your protection system if you're you know, a cardiovascular surgeon with real estate and other assets and high risk. You would have a multi-layered system like real estate and LLCs a management company owning those, and then a nice big asset protection trust protects you. That puts you in a strong position when you're being sued to completely walk away from the table because it's all a matter of how collectible are you at the end of the day. And if the other party can perceive like, wow, yeah, we're going to win this lawsuit, but we're not going to be able to collect on the damages. Law firms are businesses as well. 
And so they can't just spend and waste money because that's a quick way for them to go out of business. They have to make sure that they can have access to the damage awards that they have, which is by collecting on them. So what you want is to have a very layered and good structured asset protection plan that makes you as uncollectible as possible so that you can negotiate a fair settlement for generally you see pennies on the dollar or have these fraudulent lawsuits completely go away. Um, like they're just really scary stats. Like I, I was going, th I was going through from the AMA and it was something like 34% of all the doctors that are out there have already been sued for malpractice. And then the longer you practice, that percentage goes up to 55% by the time you're age 55. And then 85% of all those claims the doctors find are frivolous, but they've been named personally in the lawsuit as well, not just the insurance provider. And then they have to fight that even though it's a frivolous lawsuit. And then their lives can be damaged from that, their reputation, their earning capacity. And whether it was righteous, uh, you know, justified lawsuit or not, it doesn't matter. Yes, uh, in my book, The Locum Life, I researched uh, malpractice and I wrote two chapters on uh, malpractice and how to avoid it and insurance. And those statistics I remember quite, quite well because even though I'm in the 55 plus age group, I've been very lucky uh, that I haven't been sued yet, but it's only a matter of time. You know, it's just that the people who see more patients, the more patients you see, the more chances there are that one of them is going to sue you. And whether it's legitimate or not, once it's presented, you still have to be, defend yourself against it. And so it, it is a hassle. Exactly. And that's where the asset protection planning comes into play especially when it does get to higher lawsuits. It gives you again, that peace of mind. Cause that's really what asset protection is. It's just a layer of peace of mind saying, if everything falls apart and I'm about to lose everything, I can at least sleep easy knowing that my assets are not gonna be easily collected on and I'm in a position of strength when I need it. All right, so you've convinced me, I think that asset protection is is important even if I'm not a multi-millionaire just to protect whatever it is that I have. So how do I find someone to help me with that? How do I how do I know, you know, who who is qualified to do that? That's a great question. And I would say it's just like shopping around for a doctor. Like you want to find specialists. And if you're a general practitioner or a general practicing lawyer as well, um, that specialty is beyond their reach. You would be referred out to someone who's a specialty. So you want to make sure if you're looking for an asset protection attorney, generally that's all that they do. Um, if you go into just a traditional estate planning attorney for a revocable will, that's not asset protection. That's just family estate planning. And those type of trusts are completely different. They don't protect your assets. They're just there for when you die and to avoid probate and death taxes and easy transitions. Um, asset protection plans and trust protects you from creditors while you're living. Um, so you wanna make sure you go specifically to an asset protection attorney, not your real estate attorney. Their job is to be transactional and close deals. Do, you know, cross the T's, dot the I's. Your business attorneys, their draft operation agreements um, and partnership agreements. They're not asset protection attorneys. Um, so if, you're looking at it and all that attorney does is recommend a basic LLC and uses an analogy that an LLC will be a one-stop silver bullet. It's not, those are very base level. And just remember the key word in LLCs, limited. They tell you straight up in their name, they're limited liability companies. So you're gonna need to layer up as you grow, your asset protection planning grows, your insurance grows, everything should be layered up and staged up with you as you grow. So is there like a national association of asset protection attorneys where I can look people up or is it really a word of mouth? It, it was more word of mouth. We have um, asset protection council. You can, it's an actual pro asset protection council.com would be a good resource to go on. And there's a resource of a few hundred pure asset protection attorneys in there who would focus on, you know, more high risk profile, clientele who would be like real estate investors, doctors, um, someone who would actually really need a good level of asset protection beyond insurance and LLCs. Uh, and then from there, just vet the attorney that you talk to and match the attorney with what your investment and what your profession is. Um, for example, if I'm a doctor, I want to make sure that that attorney, it, 
has a lot of medical doctors as well as investors in their clientele because then they are familiar with my type of issues. Um, one last question. So I find this guy, my asset protection attorney, and I make an appointment and I sit down. What can I expect? Is this something we can resolve in an hour or am I going to have to go back there 10 times? You know, is it, is it a continuing relationship or is it, you know, we just drop the document and we're done. How, how is it going to work? Yeah, that's a great question. It should be a continuing relationship, just like with you and your CPA and your wealth managers. Um, the more you grow, the more money you're spending, the more assets you're buying. We need to be able to create the buckets to protect. And a good CPA would generally tell you, the first thing you need to do is protect your assets, because if we have nothing to file taxes on, then we <laughs> have nothing to do anyways. <laughs> and, and so the first thing is, is protect your assets and protect yourself. So then the next thing would be work with your CPAs to throttle the needle on tax mitigation strategies, and then talk to your wealth managers um, on diversifying your portfolio, however you're comfortable with. But it would be a continuing relationship. Uh, generally, it would take about an hour consultation because a good asset protection attorney won't just say, okay, you want to protect this one piece of real estate. They're going to look at you holistically from what's your W-2 job, what's the liability and risk there, what's your lifestyle like, what's your assets, how do you own them, what's the equity, because we need to know equity is what we're at, people are after when they're suing you. You know, if you're, for example, if you have a million dollar property and 80% of it is mortgage, you only have $200,000 to your name of equity to go after. Um, so we're looking at what's your unprotected net assets. And that's going to take about an hour. And so just kind of know when you're looking for these attorneys, we're going to be talking about your financial life, your personal life, your investments, um, your day job, because we have to get a full picture of who you are and what you need. And then from there, it would just be giving you our recommendation um, of what an asset protection plan we would recommend. It could be LLCs, multiple LLCs, and then another layer of a management company owning all of those mm. or a nice asset protection trust. If you really are a higher net worth, high risk, uh, you know, um, profile. And then from there, it would generally take about 30 days to create everything. And then it would be an ongoing annual relationship, just keeping us informed on I'm buying this, selling that. Um, what should I do to protect it? My CPA has a question and talking to the CPA, talking to the wealth managers and just making sure all, every year everything's kept to the regulations and the CPAs are happy, your wealth managers are happy. And then you can focus on what you're good at, your day job and finding deals. Well, Brian, this has been very enlightening. So I want to thank you for at least uh, introducing us to this concept of asset protection. I think uh, I have a lot more to learn and would learn a, a lot more from a, from a one on one. I'm not sure I'm there yet that I actually need one, but it's something to look forward to uh, in the future. And uh, this has been very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The art of medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe www.andrewwilner.com.